So I think of uh, many of the things that I've learned from people going through detox, people doing uh, mold avoidance. Um, yeah, and people just like moving through layers of detox inside. One of the coolest things I've learned um, from a man named Brian Rosner, who I believe his um, knowledge base extends beyond the art of just doing extreme mold avoidance. I think you can actually um, learn from him even if you don't do that practice. Um, but one of the things I learned from him and I believe is 100% true is that um, the ability to drink, and I would not ever like, um, not condone, but I wouldn't ever recommend drinking like Starbucks coffee or like crappy coffee. Coffee tends to be really laden with pesticide, um, mold, and you know, just sorts of all sorts of undesirables along its path. So if you're gonna drink coffee, you know, you wanna go for like mold free, the cleanest, purest coffee you can possibly get. But one of the things he talks about is that for people who are far enough along on the detox journey, they drink coffee and it energizes them. This is how I know that, for example, my liver is problematic um, compared to my dad's liver, where he drinks coffee, you know, like it's uh, like it's going out of style and uh, and it energizes him um, during my precipice of uh, allostatic load. Actually, no, that's, this isn't true. Almost any time I drink black coffee past maybe the age of 19, 20, it may have been my whole life, but I remember it being particularly bad after my mid-20s. Anytime I drank black coffee, I felt jittery, um, shaky, like kind of the feeling like you're going to throw up, just really overwhelmed and unwell um and so brian has kind of surmised and i really agree that if you can drink black coffee and it feels good to you that your the detox components um may be here but particularly in the liver and the kidneys are doing fairly well and they're fairly unburdened another drink in this category is kombucha so for example, I know people in the benzo space who um, over time would drink like, co would drink, yeah, just a black coffee um, and kombucha and they would do fine with it. And others, um, including myself, were like terrified of this. And I'm so glad that I didn't, in, in the thick of it, drink kombucha because um, for one, even that little bit of alcohol when your lower detox components are stagnated um, and the, the, the nervous system is sensitized can be really dangerous, but that amount of probiotics for a body that's not flowing well um, can be like, for benzo people can be disastrous for people with mold who haven't had that extra layer of benzo injury can be, you know, a herxing, you know, weeks, month long herxing fest where you're laid out um, and burning up and, you know, just the body's just uh, getting thrashed, basically. So these are two drinks to think about in terms of how you do with them. If you do great with them, this is a good indication that your the detox components are fairly open um, and flowing and, and, and um, in a healthy condition or at least, you know, enough to kind of tip the scales toward the good. If the detox components are run down, these two drinks will put you into hell. And early on, like before you really know you have a problem, they might just make you feel kind of nauseous, sick, jittery, um, maybe having, maybe you have some behavioral problems or, you know, things that we sort of take for granted and, and fly under the radar. Um, you know, maybe you might even have like depression or anxiety, things like that. Um, but yeah, these are very good indications of how the, uh, the lower detox components are doing and my I imagine it would indicate how your glymph is flowing from your brain what you would find I think if you did well with these drinks 
and your liver and kidneys were doing well, but you're, you're blocked up here in some fashion, what you might, might find is very extreme violent dreams um, because the glymph will, will like evacuate and flow in your sleep. Um, and so, yeah, I just think that's kind of a cool rule of thumb, right? Like it's a good sign that my friend with benzo injury mainly had benzo injury um, and not mold illness because they drank coffee and drank kombucha. One thing I will say is they also did the ketogenic diet, which may have worked back fungus and bacteria in such a way where they, you know, kind of, it kind of helped um, detox along um, in a way that maybe if they stopped doing the ketogenic diet, things would be different. I don't really know. Or maybe they made gains on that diet. For me, that diet seems to kind of be a placeholder and kind of a, uh, like a crutch for a while that works back bacteria and fungus that really gets the body flowing well. So you get a bunch of energy, you get a bunch of ability, but what happens when your body's craving an orange? What happens when, well, for one, if you're drinking a lot of kombucha, you're probably getting out of ketosis. What happens when the body is naturally craving for, for for things with an abundance of potassium and magnesium and all of the other minerals and trace minerals that come in those in those uh, high uh, glycemic foods? That's the that's that's where you run into some trouble. That's why detox is really important. But anyway, two drinks to think about. How do you how well do you do with coffee and kombucha? Um, do you remember the first time you drank a coffee and you felt like shit? Um, my father, his entire life, has drank coffee with no problems. His liver is tip top. So I really wish I would have gotten, gotten his liver or his gen more of his genetics or whatever. But anyway, hope this is helpful. Full credit to Brian Rosner. Uh, you can still learn a lot from this man and not do extreme mold avoidance, which is tricky because there's specific groups where people don't really want you in them unless you're doing that practice. Um, but you can actually still learn a ton from these people's uh, uh, discoveries and um, observations so it's really cool but you have to make sure that you know you're prioritizing what makes the most sense to you and I'm still a bit uh, puzzled um I'm still in intrigued and convinced enough by brain retraining that I'm still going to stay in that camp and really see that through um as much as humanly possible because to me those outcomes are actually the most sort of um yeah, like quelling of of um, of disability and limitation. Just overall, I feel like those sh that brain re retraining shows the best outcomes, but it's sometimes not always approachable, right? So you have to meet these two. You have to marry these two things. And I don't know many people that are like great at explaining how to do that. So it's interesting. But hope this is helpful.